Um, my name is Renee Lantner, as you can see from the title page there. Uh, some of you have probably seen me walking around also uh, with all these little tags on. Um, I'm also on the board of directors here. I'm the current secretary. I have dermatomyositis. I've had it for, depending on which way you want to hear about my history, I've either had it for 24 years or six. <laughs> it's a long story, but I've been active for six. I was in remission for about 19 years, oddly. Um, so today we're going to talk about nutrition, and it's always a little hard to do a talk right after someone ate a nice big heavy lunch because people are going to start kind of nodding off a little bit, which is fine. And I should take this opportunity to mention also, some people I noticed when I gave this yesterday were furiously trying to take notes, and obviously feel free to take notes if you'd like, but these, all these slides are on the website. If they're not now, they will be. And uh, they actually were on the website in previous talks from previous years, I should say, but I did update them this year with a few more topics. So if you go on and they're looking like they were not the same ones as today, they'll be, they'll be tweaked hopefully soon. Okay, so um, hopefully you're here to hear about nutrition. That's what I'm gonna talk about. And so what I'm gonna talk about basically is just eating healthy in general. So I think we can all always learn a little bit more about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about nutritional abnormalities and chronic diseases, some of which being the ones we have in this audience, and also some specifics that might be helpful for those of us who have myositis. So as you can see on the top, this is not rocket science. Everybody in this room kind of knows what you're supposed to do to eat healthy. We all know what we're supposed to be doing, and I'm basically going to be going over things that probably everybody in this room already knows, but it's just a kind reminder, a little gentle reminder of what we should be doing. So eating healthy foods, that's kind of a no-brainer, but what does that mean? I'm going to go into more detail about that. Eat moderate portion sizes. Anybody who comes to this country from another country realizes how ridiculous our portion sizes are, particularly when you go out to eat. Eat a, a variety of things. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And you don't want to just eat one thing. Like I remember someone years ago, he was on a raisin diet, and that's all he ate for months, which is a little ridiculous. Um, enjoy your meals. Um, the old adage of you know chewing your food, like however many times grandma used to tell us to do, that's actually not only important for just sitting and enjoying, taking a deep breath and enjoying your surroundings, but it helps tremendously with digestion. It starts in your mouth. And if you swallow your food whole, it's gonna be a lot harder to digest because there's only so much our little enzymes can do. So you need your teeth and your saliva and all that. So enjoy what you're eating. Sit down, put the placemat down, put a napkin in your lap. Maybe put some nice music on, just kind of enjoy your food. And then involve yourself in meal preparation. So if you like to cook or you're able to cook, um, even if it's just a matter of cutting some things up, it doesn't have to be you know, Emerald Lagasse style stuff, uh, try to involve yourself. One of the fun facts that I learned at one of the nutrition conferences I went to is that um, for, for every 30 minutes that you prepare your own food, that there's a drop in your BMI by 0.5, I think it was something like that. Now clearly people like Emerald Lagasse and maybe in a garden don't necessarily follow that rule so well because, well, I'll just leave it at that. And one of the things I forgot to say in, in introducing myself is I do have dermatomyositis, I am a board member, um, but I'm also a physician. Um, and by that, I wanted to let you know that I am in no way a dietary expert, but my background is in allergy and immunology, so I take care of a lot of people who have allergic diseases um, and asthma, including food allergies, um, which is obvious, not obviously, it wasn't actually anything I intended to really specialize in when I went into the field, but as many of you know, food allergies kind of gone off the deep end um, in incidents. So uh, I've had to learn a lot about how to teach people what to eat or not to eat. I also have had very picky family members. At one time, I've had a vegan, a vegetarian, a picky husband for most of the 30 years I've known him. So I've learned how to cook a lot of different kinds of foods and also um, tell people what they should or shouldn't eat. So a lot of us in the room here have a form of myositis. A lot of us are just here because we care about someone who has myositis. But the thing is, um, no matter what we have, we're all a product of our genes and we can thank our parents or not thank our parents for the, some of the stuff we have. So some of that we can't control. We can't control our genetics, but we can control some other things, including what we eat. So in, in addition to all the fun stuff we are, all, are already dealing with, myositis and some other things that some of us also have, we can also get other problems too. We can get diabetes, we can get heart disease, we can get cancer, and we can get Alzheimer's. So there are things we can do to maybe stave off some of those other problems. 
You've all heard about antioxidants, um, so just really quickly, um, these are foods or food substances that can decrease oxidative stress, which is just a, basically a way of saying that uh, functions in our body can sometimes give off molecules that are destructive to our tissues and are not helpful, and they can be found in more places um, that have been researched, things like heart disease and cancer. The antioxidants uh, you might hear about as being called water soluble, which just means that they can be dissolved in water and are also very easily passed out of our urinary system, so it's kind of hard to overdose on them unless you have really severe kidney disease. Vitamin C would be one of those things. Fat soluble ones are not only ones that um, need fat to absorb them more properly, but also might get stored a little bit longer. And those technically you could not overdose, but you could have too much. Some of you might recall some flack about vitamin E in the last several years that you can't just take as much vitamin E forever as you want. It might actually increase heart disease. So some of these things you want, want to be a little bit careful about. Antioxidants in general, you probably already know this too, they're mostly found in what we would consider the healthy foods. So fruits and vegetables and nuts and spices, things that have a lot of color to them usually have a lot of antioxidants. The one thing that's been pretty clear, and I think we all know this in our gut, no pun intended, but that eating a fresh food the way it came off the tree or out of the ground is going to be much better for you than a supplement, partly because you can't quite mimic everything that's in a food and put it in a pill. A good example of that is for many, many decades, they've been trying to mimic breast milk by making different kinds of formula. And there's really no way to make it perfectly the same way as it comes out of a mother. And similarly, if you're taking you know, vitamin A, B, C through Z, um, it's not going to be the same thing as eating that fresh fruit or vegetable because there are compounds in there we might not even know about yet that might be helpful. So here's a list of antioxidants. Again, a lot of these are very familiar to you. Uh, one of my favorite foods in the world is on the bottom here, dark chocolate, which is why it has two exclamation points after it. The problem with dark chocolate, of course, is beside, aside from it being, well, it is a wonderful food, but it, for most cases, has a lot of sugar attached to it. So if you're going to have dark chocolate, sadly, the higher content you go is better for you, which is starts approximating the taste of dirt. But it is, it is quite, quite good for you. Um, balance. A lot of people don't realize this, and again, getting not trying to be funny, but you know, for someone that's like on the all raisin diet or the all artichoke diet or something, if you overdo it with one food, some of these foods have helpful but also sometimes interfering chemicals. So for example, if you overeat spinach or you have way too much cocoa and nothing else, you might have too many oxalates and those combine things like calcium. So some of you may have heard of kidney stones and some of the ones are called calcium oxalate stones. Um, an uh, example I gave yesterday is some of the parents, I see kids and adults in my practice and some of the moms are so proud that they, they send their child to school with chocolate milk so they're getting all their calcium. Well, the problem with chocolate milk is, aside from the sugar, is that the cocoa binds the calcium so you're really not doing them any favors by giving them chocolate milk for calcium purposes. Um, and similarly, you can see things like legumes, which would be like the dried beans or maybe even lentils and whole grains. Again, if that's all you ate, then you might have problems absorbing some of these other minerals and vitamins. But for the most part, again, balance is good and take a little bit of everything. Eat your veggies and fruits are in parentheses and I'll tell you why in a second. So basically, there is no such thing as a bad vegetable. Um, you can really eat as many vegetables as you want. The exceptions would be maybe potatoes and corn. And for those of you that are familiar with the term glycemic index, you might know that potatoes and corn have a very high glycemic index. Some people also say the same thing about carrots, which basically means that it can really dump a lot of sugar into your bloodstream very quickly. And then later on, if any of you have had, like I was a little disappointed in the breakfast this morning, the, the pastries and then the French toast and then the sugar, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I was sort of asked about the breakfast, so I'm a little, I have to talk to them about that. Um, so the sugar goes up and then, I think we've all experienced this at one time or another, about two hours later, it crashes and then you get all jittery and you feel like you have to eat something. So that's what a high glycemic food could do to you, is give you a big peak, insulin kicks in, and, and it pops back down. But over a long period of time of eating like that, it's not good for your insulin and sugar um, system. But other vegetables really can be eaten in an unlimited supply as long as the preparation doesn't inv involve you know, deep fat frying and coating it with ranch dressing, that sort of thing. Again, I think we all know this stuff, it's just a matter of being reminded. And the thing with fruit, I don't think anybody would say, well, fruit's not really good for you. But the thing is, fruit has sugar. 
And I think most of us should think of fruit as being one fruit is a serving, and maybe two or more is dessert. And the other thing I'd like you to think about is if you've ever made fresh squeezed orange juice and you've noticed how many oranges it takes you to get, you know, maybe even a half a cup, sometimes it's three or four oranges. And I don't think too many of you would sit and eat three or four oranges at one time. And again, the nice thing about the whole fruit is that you're getting all these other things from a little bit of the peel and some of the membrane in between, which might have some additional um, nutrients. Carbohydrates, our love-hate relationship. It's kind of like prednisone, our love-hate relationship with prednisone. And I love this word that was coined a few years ago called garbage. Garbage. So I think we can see it's a combination of carbohydrates and garbage. Um, and I think a lot of us in this room would also recognize, and me, me being a, a sugar sugarholic, sweet tooth person, I can definitely tell you that they've shown in definite research that sugar can really be addictive. And if you have sugar, you often want to crave more. And when you don't go with, with, if you go without it for a while, you actually lose your craving for it. And I know this from personal experience. Uh, they really have shown that it is something that can be addictive. Um, learning to lower your glycemic load, I kind of alluded to that with the high glycemic foods. You want to choose foods that are not likely to do that. And there are lots of lists. If you go on the web or anywhere, you can get lots of lists of foods that are low glycemic. Uh, avoiding all processed foods, again, I think we all know this, that if it's got more chemicals in there than you can shake a stick at and you can't pronounce half of them, and the first ingredient is the only thing that looks like a food, then you probably shouldn't be eating that. And then there's this little thing called fight the white, which I think is a good thing to think about. And it's not to say you should never eat anything that is the color white, but a lot of the white foods have a high glycemic index and don't have a lot of nutritional value. Partly they're white because they've been bleached or stripped or something processed in a way to take a lot of their nutrients out. So if you're gonna have grains, they should be whole grains. We've heard this forever, we know this already. So things like bulgur wheat, maybe whole wheat, which I'll talk about in a minute, brown rice, quinoa. High fructose corn syrup is just basically evil. It's bad, bad, bad. Um, again, one of the nutritional conferences I went to, there was a gentleman who I believe was a gastroenterologist or a liver specialist, and they have likened in, in studies looking at high fructose corn syrup, taken for a long period of time, that it can cause similar damage to the liver as alcohol can. So it's really, really, really bad. There's nothing good about high fructose corn syrup. And if you look in just about any condiment, ketchup, pickle relish, probably not mustard, it's everywhere. So you really, uh, yogurts, which we always think of as being very healthy, you really need to kind of look at it. And I'm not saying you should never have it, but just keep in mind this is really not something that's good for your body. Soda has high fructose corn syrup if it's a, a non-diet, but the diet sodas and all sodas actually have phosphoric acid in them sort of as a preservative, which we now know is really not good for your bones and maybe some other things like your, your kidneys. Okay, now we all need fats in our diet. Fats are not bad. In fact, we need fats for a lot of the functions in our, in our nervous system and absorbing vitamins, like I said earlier, that are fat soluble, but there are some good ones and bad ones. So we have a tremendous over imbalance in this westernized part of the world of omega-3s and 6s. Uh, some people have heard them called PUFAs, which stands for polyunsaturated fatty acids. That's where the PUFA comes from. Sometimes they call them EFAs or EFAs, which is essential fatty acid. And whenever you hear the word essential, it basically means that we, it's essential that we get it in our diet because we can't make it ourselves. So you have to get it from someplace else. We know that um, the overabundance of omega-6, for example, is responsible in a large way for why there's such an obesity epidemic in this country and in other westernized world countries and heart disease. You can think of omega-3 as an anti-inflammatory and you can think of omega-6 as an anti-inflammatory too, only if it's done in a moderate amount. But unfortunately, we have a huge overabundance of omega-6s in our diets and that's now considered pro-inflammatory. Now usually we think of pro as a good word, but here pro-inflammatory is not a good thing. You don't want to have a pro-inflammatory thing. So as you can see on the last bullet here, the early human diet, and I don't even know how long ago this had to be to be like this. I'm guessing it was way before the 20th century, but the human diet used to be a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning that they had equal parts of three and six. And now it's 10 to 15 to one, six, omega-6s, which is really, really high. So the good guys are the omega-3s, 
There are a few different uh, alphabet things you might hear about. One is ALA, which is alpha-linoleic acid, and these are derived mainly from plant sources. So flax seeds, walnuts, you've all heard about this. You know, they've added flax seed oil, take your flax seed oil supplements, sprinkle your flax seeds on there, and that's great. Uh, they have a high amount, as does canola oil. Before I forget to say, I will probably bring it up again, but canola oil is not an evil thing. The problem with canola oil, which is also called rapeseed oil, but I can see why they don't want to use that word. It just doesn't sound very appealing. Um, 80 to 90 percent probably of all canola oil, uh, in, in addition to um, corn and soy in this country, is uh, genetically modified. So if that's of any concern to you, you might just want to get organic canola oil. But it is a good source of omega-3s. Now, the, the only problem with using plant sources of omega-3s in the ALA form is that our bodies have to convert it to EPA and DHA. Those are very long, long words. I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce them for you. But EPA and DHA are the ones that really kind of do the lion's share of the anti-inflammatory work. And as we get older, we don't convert that very well from ALA to those two compounds. And men in general just don't convert them as well as women do. So if you really want to get good um, omega-3s, you might need to eat a lot of flaxseed or a lot of walnuts, which again are high in fat or oil or calories, um, or you can just go right to the EPA and DHA. Now for me, I love oily fish, I love salmon, so for me it's easy. I like eggs, and now we've all seen the eggs in the grocery store that are enriched with omega-3, so we've all have access to that. And then again, as supplements, now I would rather eat my fish than swallow it as a pill, but again, if you're not a fish lover or you're a vegetarian for that matter and you can't do fish oil, um, the fish eat the algae that has the DHA in it, which is how they get their sources. So you can do algae or fungal sources of DHA and then kind of bypass the problem with the plant-based ones. The other good thing about the omega-3s is that they can, I said they were anti-inflammatory, so they can, they can decrease the production of some inflammatory molecules, including TNF-alpha, which stands for tumor necrosis factor alpha. Uh, some of you may have heard of this, and the, for people that are taking omega-3s and may also be on an anti-TNF-alpha therapy, that would be something like Humira or Remicade, uh, for things like rheumatoid arthritis, it actually can increase the efficacy of these drugs. So again, eating oily, wild, especially wild-caught fish, once or three times a week might be enough, meaning you don't have to have a supplement. Or you can do the fancy krill oil, which is a little bit more expensive. And the, the word distilled, it's there in the parentheses. I think that's something really important to think about when you're buying a supplement. As we all unfortunately know, a lot of fish out there, especially the bigger the, bigger the fish, the more likely they are to have mercury or PCBs because they've been feeding on the littler fish on the way up the chain. So if you're going to get a supplement, make sure it's from a good manufacturer. It might even say ultra distilled or micro filtered, that sort of thing so you're not swallowing mercury along with your <laughs> omega-3s. Those aren't <coughs> too good for you. Um, unfortunately, you're going to be seeing this last comment a lot on the supplements I'm talking about, is that if you are on Coumadin or other blood thinners, or you have a history of bleeding, or you're on high-dose aspirin for some reason, uh, you might want to be careful taking some of these supplements, and you'll, you'll see that repeated throughout the ones that are pertinent. They can sometimes increase bleeding tendency. All right, so sort of the bad guys are omega-6s. Now, I said before, they're anti-inflammatory unless they're eaten in excess, which unfortunately is what most of us do. So the, the good ones are um, safflower, sunflower, grapeseed, soy, and corn oil, but again, in moderation. And I think any of us who buy chips or whatever, they're often cooked in these kind of oils, so you're getting a lot of omega-6s and not a lot of omega-3s. And um, so you just have to be careful. Another supplement that is called gamma linoleic acid, or GLA for short, may be a good anti-inflammatory agent. And it has been shown to possibly be helpful for some autoimmune disorders. Now, as I go forward with this talk too, I know there are people in here who have IBM or care for someone with IBM. And unfortunately, a lot of the things I'm going to be discussing have to do with more autoimmune problems, which is more DM and PM. But that doesn't mean there's no hope. So we'll just keep listening. Um, for the GLA type things, you can choose borage, black currant, or evening primrose oils. In particular, something like borage oil. Borage is a plant, uh, and I can't imagine you would ever find a product that doesn't have these removed, but you want to make sure they don't have any pyrrolizidine alkaloids, which is a mouthful, but basically it's a, a plant-derived chemical that they all make 
that can be toxic to the liver. But any manufacturer, unless you're chewing on the leaves from the garden, um, they're going to be safe. And again, you have to be careful with this if you're on blood thinners. Now, omega-7s, I'm going to hazard a guess that not too many people have heard of omega-7s, because I can say I hadn't heard about them until fairly recently. So these are conjugated linoleic acids, uh, otherwise known as CLA. And these are made from animals that basically chew their cud. I didn't know, well, I guess I did know kangaroos are ruminants, but I think we all know about sheep and sheep, goats, and cows. And these animals have a high amount of omega-7. And these compounds have been found to be anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, unfortunately not for those with HER2 positive breast cancer, but in general, anti-cancer, anti-rheumatoid arthritis, anti-lupus, anti-abdominal fat deposits, which those of us in our later years don't like to talk about because it's that little extra tire some of us get. It can promote muscle growth. I want to be very clear. I'm all about muscle growth because I've been trying for six years to get my muscles back, but I'm not saying this is for myositis. I'm just saying in general, they've shown this, um, that omega-7 can help with muscle growth. And it opposes stress-induced cortisol, which is, again, that lovely chemical that gives us that little spare tire when we're stressed out. Grass-fed animals, we've been hearing a lot about that, and I know some of my friends will argue with me that grass-fed is not good for um, other things, like maybe contributing to the greenhouse gas effect, but in, in general, I know that a lot of people have heard about some of the health benefits of grass-fed animals and their products like milk. Well, here's one reason. Grass-fed animals have basically three to five times more, or 300 to 500% more CLA than grain-fed animals of the same type. If you are already overweight, you might want to be careful about having too much uh, animal or dairy products from this group because it might cause insulin resistance, which is not something you would want. Okay, so we do need some fat in our diet. Fats make cooking taste better, make our food taste better, has that nice mouth feel. So what, good, what are the good fats or good oils to use? So for cooking, um, we've all heard about this. You know, everyone should be using olive oil, the whole Mediterranean diet thing. And olive oil is great. Um, the whole Rachel Ray Evu thing, the extra virgin olive oil, that's great if you want to sprinkle it on your bruschetta or your salad dressing. It's expensive or more expensive than just plain old olive oil. And olive oil pretty much loses its, all of its potency after about three months in terms of the um, antioxidant value. So you gotta use it pretty quickly after it's been made or purchased. And um, it, it really isn't worth using the extra virgin for cooking because you're gonna lose all that flavor anyway. And it's uh, saved for stuff you actually wanna taste in your mouth. Walnut oil is expensive, but it's also very good. The omega-3s I talked about, flaxseed oil, um, you can cook with it, but most people just drizzle it on stuff. And then I mentioned earlier about the organic canola because it's not, or, uh, it's not going to be genetically modified. And sunflower and safflower, again, if they're expeller pressed or what's called cold pressed, it means that they're not heat treated, they're not chemically treated, so they're going to retain a lot of their nutrition and they're also not going to be genetically modified. Coconut oil has been making a bit of a splash in the last few years. It is a saturated fat but it's a medium chain as opposed to a long chain saturated fat. And so a lot of people tout this is like the best fat or really great fat. It does smell and taste like coconut. So if you're, just keep that in mind. Uh, it does have a very high smoke point, which means that if you're turning your heat up really high to saute something, it's not gonna be smoking up your room. Like olive oil has a very low smoke point. So if you heat that up, you're gonna have smoke all over your kitchen. Oh, before we go on here, just real quickly, um, there were a couple questions yesterday, what about macadamia oil? And I didn't know what to say about that, so I looked it up last night after someone asked the question. And um, it's actually great. It's good for uh, omega-3s. It's got a wonderful taste and flavor, but it's pretty expensive. So it might be something, I mean, I, I'm aware of it. I just, I never really see it. I live in Chicago. We don't see it all over the shelves like I know they do more on the West Coast or Hawaii, certainly. But um, it would be more of like a drizzling oil, but it is very healthy, but it's an oil and it's fat, so keep that in mind. Someone also asked about rice bran oil yesterday, and it was another thing I had to look up. And it's also very good for high smoke point. It's got a high vitamin E content, which may or may not be good if you're having too much of it. The problem with it is that it has a very high omega-6 content. So if you're going to do rice bran oil, make sure you're getting a lot of omega-3s also. Okay, so I kind of went over this already. So fatty fish, pasture-fed beef and pork, omega-3 fortified eggs, seeds that are for plants, 
nuts, especially the ones listed there, and you might even want to consider eating some of the weeds in your yard. So I, this is from my house, um, and this year, I don't know, I have a very, very small vegetable garden. I have a very small yard and very little sun. Um, but the purslane, which is the name of this weed here, is all over the place. I'm guessing you guys all have it if you have a yard and you're not in an apartment or a condo. Um, it, it just kind of grows out of nothing. I don't know where it comes from, but it's just all over my yard. And um, it's got the highest amount of ALA. Again, it's plants, so you have to convert it, but you could eat a ton of this. And um, it just it tastes like green. It's not, it's, not, it's not like watercress or it's not spicy like arugula. It's just tastes like a green vegetable and it's kind of crunchy and so eat your weeds too. <laughs> okay. What's that? Um, well, sometimes if I'm in the garden, I just kind of grab some and shove it in my mouth and I gave some to my daughter and she put it in a stir fry. So yeah, it, it's, yeah, it just keeps growing it, and some of them get big too. They get like the leaves get fat and plump, plump and kind of cool. All right, so what fats not to eat? Again, I think this was pretty clear from before. Anything that's partially hydrogenated is just bad. Uh, and avoid these, these uh, corn, cottonseed, vegetable, palm, or, palm kernel, safflower and sunflower unless they're expeller pressed. And I think we all know to avoid fried foods. And this is not to say, I mean, I have french fries once in a while, um, although I don't really like to because I'll tell you about potatoes in a second. <laughs> um, but we all have heard about trans fats and how evil they are for us, so just try not to do too many things that are made in a lot of high heat. Anti-inflammatory diet is something that a lot of us have heard about. Well, what is it? Well, it's pretty much what I just told you. It's kind of eating, or it's sometimes with my patients when I'm trying to get them to lose weight, even though I'm not primary care, it's something that I feel is important. And so I'll have the occasional weightlifter guy that wants to lose, he goes, oh, you mean eating clean? So they all know what that means. It's basically you eat things the way nature intended it. You don't eat tons of stuff. You don't eat processed foods. And that's basically what I was just telling you about. So you want to eat not processed foods, eat the whole food the way nature intended it to be, avoiding sugar. Some people asked about, well, what about you know um, agave or honey or maple syrup? Well, they all have sugar. They're all sugar. They're all sugar. Um, stevia, some people find is fine. Uh, I think it's probably fairly safe since it comes from a plant. I find it a little bit off tasting. Um, I've grown stevia plants and tasted them and I think they just taste a little off to me. Uh, some people think that if you're going to indulge in a sugar once in a while, like I'll take some plain yogurt and stick some maple syrup on there because maple syrup at least has some antioxidants because it comes from a tree. Um, and we talked about avoiding high fructose corn syrup. And then eating lean protein. We all need protein, of course, and lean is better. And if you can do free range chickens, the happy chickens as I call them, or grass fed beef or pork. Remember those vegetables? I think I drove that home. Broth based soups are very, very good, especially if you make them from scratch using you know, the leftover bones from whatever you were doing. Um, they have a lot of nutrients in them. Some people, of course, we all grew up you know, with chicken soup when we weren't feeling well. There's actually some data to support why that's healthy for you. And it also, for people that are maybe trying to lose a little weight, it can kind of fill your stomach up with good calories, meaning that there aren't that many calories, but good nutrition. And then you might not want to pound down that cheeseburger because your stomach's a little full. Uh, tea, especially if it's green, white, or oolong. Oolong is a kind of a, it's between black and green. It's not quite as fermented as black. Chocolate, you already heard mine talk about that. And then consider eating organically. And I'm going to talk about that more in a moment. So a woman named Rosemary Istry, who's a clinical psychologist, and unfortunately I don't believe she's at the conference this year, she has dermatomyositis, and I'm actually giving this talk now because a few years ago she wasn't able to make it because she wasn't feeling well, and I kind of stepped in and just kind of helped out that day, and then I was flattered enough to be asked to come back to do this. So she did a study in 2007 with um, a number of patients who had myositis, and she just asked them to follow an anti-inflammatory diet pretty much what I just told you. And she followed them over 12 weeks and she found that these people significantly had improved their ease of routine activities, severity of their depression, and their grip, arm, and leg strength measurements. So now that's just a plate of something I made. I can't remember what it is now. I think it's like quinoa and kale and something, I don't know. That's how I eat, I mean that's actually how I eat. Uh, consider eating organic. Now, the big controversy about organic, and, and one of the points I want to make is, is the, the bottom point there first, 
is that it's pretty clear that organic blueberries versus regular blueberries are still going to have the same amount of antioxidants, probably same number of calories, same number of you know vitamin A and C, but it's not really clear if the pesticides or the fact that we're inserting animal genes into vegetables in the long run is going to bother us. Is it going to bother our kids or grandkids having children? Did it cause us to have myositis in the first place? No one really knows. And in case some of you don't really know, I mean, hybridization has been going on forever and ever and ever. So we know that some fruits and vegetables are better now because they've been modified in a way that's just taking the best ones and putting them together. But what, what I don't like about genetically modified foods is, to give you a specific example, there's a, a type of tomato that's been developed to resist freezing. And the way they did that is they took a gene from an Arctic fish and inserted it into the tomato plant. Now, to me, that's a little freaky, and that's not exactly how tomatoes were meant to be grown. So thank you very much. I'd rather not have fish gene-inserted tomatoes. But, and, and the thing is, they don't really have to prove they're safe in order for them to go on the market. So we might find out for 50 years from now that you know, when our kids start having problems or their grandkids that it was too late then. So GMO foods are, um, non-GMO foods rather, are almost always going to be listed as organic. Um, don't feel guilty if you don't have organic food. It is most of the time a little bit more expensive. There are some foods you probably should stay away from, and this is what's called the dirty dozen. And these aren't necessarily genetically modified foods, but a lot of times these are highly pesticided. Um, and that's where I was going to bring your attention to the um, potatoes. Potatoes, uh, I only buy organic potatoes after I read and heard some things about the fungicides and other things they put on potatoes that sometimes I've heard that the farmers won't even eat their own potatoes and they will stay out of the room for days until the stuff kind of dissipates. Um, same thing's been said with spinach, that it's very highly pesticided. I know like I go to Trader Joe's and they specifically have a pesticide-free frozen spinach because it's something that people want. Um, we've all heard about strawberries, I think, that they usually have a lot of pesticides and apples. Uh, some of these things aren't that easy to find, but if you can either grow your own or look for things that are not, um, or if you, if you go to a farmer's market, just ask them. You know, if all their apples look perfect and none of them ever have any blobs on them, you might just want to say, so what do you guys, you know, what do you guys use on your apples? These are what are called the Clean 15, and again, all this is going to be on the website, and if you're just interested in getting more updates, uh, the dailygreen.com is where I got this information, and it's been around the internet a million times. I'm sure some of you have seen these lists already. So these are just the, the foods that you can probably feel pretty good about. You don't have to scrub with solutions and worry about if they're going to have pesticides or not. Salt. This is something I added this year because there was a bit of a hoopla in the, in the science literature over the last year. Some of you might be familiar with this information. So just to talk about salt for a minute. We're supposed to get between 1,200 milligrams as we age to about 1,500 milligrams if you're under 50 of, of sodium or salt. And not, I guess this isn't terribly surprising, but one, meaning a single, McDonald's bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit has 1,250 milligrams of salt. So for those of us, you know, basically in this age group that we're all in here, that's your day's worth of salt. 77% of the sodium that we ingest comes from restaurants. I don't think that's a huge surprise to anybody. Everybody knows salt and butter are chef's best friends. Um, processed food, of course, has a lot of salt in it. The rest of it comes from home cooked, the stuff we add at the table, and then 12% of the sodium we get is just naturally occurring in foods. So the studies I was referring to, they recently showed in human and mouse cells that were cultured in a basically a high salt bath produced more of an immune cell called TH17, which stands for helper cell, T helper cell 17, more of those than that were grown in normal non-salty conditions. So some forms of autoimmunity, again, it's not really quite clear how many this extends to, have been linked to too many TH17 cells, which is, again, this type of helper, helper T cell that produces a protein that's pro-inflammatory. Again, this is not a good thing. Pro-inflammatory protein called interleukin-17. Sometimes you'll see it listed as capital I-L-17. So we all know the rise in popularity of fast food, which is, again, what gives our part of the world a bad name. It's laden with up to 100 times as much salt as you would make the same thing at home. And it seems to, this, this trend seems to also accompany an increase in autoimmune diseases. Now that's not to say that's the only reason we have autoimmune diseases. I'll talk about a few other reasons, maybe why, in a minute. 
And this would be particularly relevant, this, this uh, TH17 issue, for people with multiple sclerosis and psoriasis, which we know are strongly influenced by this type of molecule in the cell. The other thing that I added this year is something that's always been of interest to me because as an allergist who takes care of a lot of the asthmatics, unfortunately some of whom are very overweight, we've known for years that asthmatic meds don't work well in people who are heavy. They just don't work as well. And we've known for many, many years too that people who have extra fat have too much inflammatory molecules circulating around their system. So we know that increased body mass index is associated with increased inflammation. That's been known for years. That's not surprising. When they looked at um, inflammatory conditions like asthma, as I mentioned, and rheumatoid arthritis, we know that medications such as steroids um, and the other kind of, uh, that's um, Humira, Embril, and Remicade, those three listed at the bottom, they don't work as well if you're overweight. So just something to keep in mind. <laughs> so this is sort of summarizing things up, at least for this last section. So eat the rainbow, lots of fruits and vegetables and lots of colors. Fight the white without the added salt, the sugar, the tato potatoes, the rice, the white bread, or maybe you shouldn't any, eat any wheat bread at all, and I'll explain that in a moment. Curcumin. A lot of people have had curcumin and maybe not even realized it. It's the ingredient that's in turmeric. If you've ever had yellow mustard, you've had turmeric. If you've ever had Indian food, you've had turmeric. Uh, it's been used for many, many, many decades or centuries, especially in Indian cooking. And there's been a lot of interest in this, in inhibiting inflammation, especially with inflammatory conditions and also cancer and Alzheimer's. So these are both mice studies, but they were done within the last 10 years, and they showed that the CK, or CPK as some of us know, our muscle enzymes, did not go up as high after these mice had exercise-induced muscle damage. I want to be very clear, these were not mice that had myositis, but again, something having to do with inflammation of the muscles. And then a later study in mice, again, improved them, but they had muscular dystrophy. So again, muscles, but not necessarily myositis. Curcumin gets in the body best through the colon. It gets absorbed there, um, or it accumulates, I should say. So for that reason, they've looked at a lot of gastrointestinal diseases because that's where it seems to accumulate. Unfortunately, it's very poorly absorbed. So if you guys are on a turmeric or curcumin, curcumin supplement, there's a good chance you're really not getting much into your system. Uh, we know that less than four grams a day, which is a lot, was not detected in the serum when they did human studies. So you'd have to take a, a boatload of this to get it in your system. But they are looking at new ways to get it so it's absorbed more easily into the body. The best way to ensure that you're getting some turmeric or curcumin is to have the supplement that you're getting, if you choose to use it, combined with what they call piperine or black pepper extract. This seems to boost the absorption. But again, like I mentioned earlier, like with the fish oil and some other things like the borage oil, it might increase bleeding if you're on a blood thinner. So this, this theme keeps coming back up. And the other thing is, um, because it has an inhibitory effect on um, cyclooxygenase 1 and 2, which is what COX-1 and 2 are, there's a small chance it might increase cardiac disease. Some of you might be familiar with the whole um, Viox issue that came up many years ago. It was a, an anti inflammatory that some people ended up having problems with cardiac disease. So, but obviously in general, if you're gonna think about this, it would be a good idea to have good lipids anyway. Of course, you can't go on a statin, right? <laughs> we shouldn't be anyway. Every year I've come to this, um, in fact, the first year when I tried to help out when uh, Dr. Istry couldn't make it, there were a lot of questions about CoQ10. And I had to admit, especially my specialty, it didn't come up that much. I really didn't know much about it. And then I realized that a lot of people started using it because of its link supposedly to statin-induced myopathies or myositis. So what's known is that a reduction in CoQ10 or coenzyme Q10, also known as ubiquinone, can cause, um, and that should say abnormal mitochondrial function. That's kind of like a double negative there. And mitochondrial function is very important at the cellular level for a lot of different things that we have in our body. So statins can lower the level of CoQ10, but they haven't really shown that if you take a supplement, it's gonna come back up again. And then there was a big um, kind of review of the literature back in 2008 that said that the present evidence at that time did not support the supplementation for statin-induced myopathy. Now, I imagine there might be some people in this room who, in addition to unfortunately having one of the myositis's, um, also had problems with statins, so even with that, it does seem to really help. 
And then on top of that, there's really no evidence that it's going to help um, myositis or idiopathic inflammatory myopathies, which is what IIM stands for. And that's what we all have is IIM. As we age, too, the other problem is that um, our absorption of CoQ10 and switching it from ubiquinone to ubiquinol decreases. So if you're going to take a supplement, you probably just might as well go for the ubiquinol instead of ubiquinone because it's going to be absorbed better anyway. It's not really clear if you take a ton of it, is it going to make any difference? If it's high in your serum, does it get to the tissues anyway? Because the tissues, like our muscles, are where it would matter, and nobody really knows that right now. The one thing that they have shown it has been very helpful in is cardiac disease, neurologic disease, and periodontal disease. The reason I bolded and underlined that is for those of you who have dermatomyositis like myself, you may know that there has been, in some types of it, at least mine, there's a very strong relationship between uh, gingivitis and uh, periodontal disease. In fact, if you want an interesting thing to show your doctor, and I showed my dentist who kept bugging me about flossing more, and when I finally got my disease under control, he goes, your gums look fantastic. I'm like, well, this because I'm now gamma globulin, and that's what made it better. Um, so there's a New England Journal, um, it's not an article, it's actually just a photo thing from several years ago where they showed the uh, Gotrans papules that some of us have had for dermatomyositis on our knuckles associated with really bad gums. And so those go together. So there might be, for those of us who have that little fun collection of symptoms, CoQ10 might be helpful. The amount of CoQ10, or ubiquinol, I should say, that's been used is 150 milligrams a day. And again, I mentioned taking the, the all versus the own for better absorption. And once again, you have to be careful with blood thinners. Vitamin D. Um, I think this is a really important topic, and I, I kind of wish more people would know about this or their doctors would know about this. We know that vitamin D seems to have a role in preventing autoimmune disease. It's been pretty well established that most autoimmune diseases, when you get them from the beginning of their diagnosis, almost all of them are going to have a low vitamin D level, as did I. Mine was super low, which really surprised me. We don't really know if putting people on vitamin D is going to make a difference for things like autoimmune disease, um, but it can help other things. I'll get to that in a minute. But again, statin-induced myositis patients got better 87% of the time if they went on vitamin D supplementation. Again, that's not what we have, but it's just maybe a hint that maybe it'll help the muscles. So I think all of us know that we're supposed to have vitamin D for bone health. Um, what people may not know is that, uh, in fact, if I see teenagers and a lot of teenagers are going through a rough period. Uh, if they're dealing with some depression, one of the first things I get is checking their thyroid and also a vitamin D level. And it's, it's often amazing to me how low it is despite how active these kids are and they're supposed to be outside. And they've also shown, especially in hospitalized patients, that low vitamin D levels are much more likely to have people with higher infection rates. So what's really important, especially for people like me with dermatomyositis, is we're not supposed to be in the sun. We're supposed to be vampires. We're not supposed to go outside anymore unless you're like completely covered in, in all sorts of stuff. So that was partly why my vitamin D went down. And if you have dark skin, you are much, much less likely to absorb the sun to get the vitamin D. So a lot of my African-American patients, I get their vitamin D levels, and they're very low. Because, um, again, I see a lot of asthmatics, and we know that asthma is also something that's affected by this. Anybody been on prednisone? Okay, that decreases your, your vitamin D level too. Um, now, the, it's not a controversy, but if you get a lab result back, it's going to say anything under 30 is considered low. So 29 is technically low, but if it's like 14 that mine was like, or 11 that my husband's was, um, that's low. And if it's under 20, it's called insufficiency. If it's under 10, it's called deficiency. And uh, you want to get that boosted up. There have been some people that I will call non-medical practitioners of caregiving that have tried to really push this level up to like 60 or 80. And from studies that have been done, it's not really shown that that's helpful and it might be harmful. So the, the, the sweet spot might be right around 40 to 45. So for deficiency, um, you could start with 2,000 units a day, or in my case, I just took 50,000 units once a week because mine was so low, I wanted to get it up pretty quickly. Uh, a very, very, very rough rule of thumb is if you want to boost your level by 10, you'd need to go up by 1,000 units a day. That's not, it doesn't work out that well. And if you're heavy, like I mentioned before, you're going to probably have to at least double that dose to get the absorption. And then generally, you want to recheck it after about six weeks to see if you're making any progress. The one thing I should mention too, and um, sorry, is in addition to 
so the mental health that I mentioned up there, um, I just a personal uh, piece about me is I was on prednisone for a very long time. Then they decided to do a DEXA scan on my, my bone density. My bone density was low. Then they checked my vitamin D level, which was low. And then in the meantime, um, I'm around sick people a lot. I'm a physician, and I was getting sick. And then I went on vitamin D. I stopped getting sick. My mood got better, which was really kind of a nice bonus. And who among us couldn't use a better mood with everything we're dealing with? So it's kind of a win-win. And there's a reason they call it the sunshine vitamin, because it really, it really does help. OK, folic acid, otherwise called folate or B9, vitamin B9. Um, I'm on methotrexate as well. So anybody who's on methotrexate probably is on folic acid or folate. Um, it's uh, been added along with it to make sure that we don't have the side effects associated with methotrexate, which are listed there. The supplement has been, I've seen anywhere from one to two milligrams a day, which is what I take. Some people take five milligrams a week. I had one person, I think last year, the year before say their doctor says they don't need it, which seemed a little scary to me. Um, I had one person in here yesterday and last year who was on leucovorin instead, which is folaninic acid, and I have no idea why you would use that instead of folic acid because it's more expensive. And as far as I could tell, I don't think it works any better, but it's another option. Um, it is a little bit controversial whether you can or can't take it on the same day as your methotrexate. I, since I did this finding, I don't take it on the same day as my methotrexate, and it seems to be fine. The other thing is that there's a little bit of a typo on this next bullet here. Um, if you're on folate, you want to make very sure that you don't have a vitamin B deficiency because uh, vitamin B deficiency can be masked by folate, and it should say supplementation, not deficiency. So if you had a folate deficiency and you were taking folate to replenish that deficiency, it might mask the symptoms of vitamin B12. Unfortunately, what it won't fix are the neurological complications you, you could get if your vitamin B12 is low. Good sources of vitamin B12 are fish, shellfish, beef, and eggs. And one comment I'm also going to make about vit vitamin B12, I'm going to make a guess that at least a quarter of the people in this room are on what we call a PPI, proton pump inhibitor, inhibitor <laughs> like Nexium or Prevacid or Prilosec. You don't have to raise your arms or anything. Or you might be on Zantac or Prevacid. Um, uh, sorry, Pepsid. All those uh, acid reducers are known, especially the PPIs, are known, they think, long term with more than three months of use to decrease your vit vitamin B12, as well as your magnesium, as well as some other uh, nutrients. So that might be something to think about with your physicians. Probiotics. Um, this is another area where the deficiency of normal gut flora has been definitely associated with autoimmune disease. And some of the thinking behind that is that if you have abnormal bacteria in your gut, it's leaky, which means that they're, like, the spaces aren't tight and things that normally should be staying out of our system are getting through. And the body's going, whoa, we don't like this. We don't know what this is. We don't recognize you. We're going to make an antibody response to it. But oh, by the way, it kind of looks like your, your, your muscle tissue or your thyroid tissue. So we're going to attack that as well, which is what autoimmune means. We're attacking ourselves. It has been shown in many inflammatory conditions that if you go on a probiotic, it can help. And some of you may have heard of this term called the human biome or microbiota, which refers to the good bacteria that we're supposed to have in our guts. And I've seen anywhere from what they think our immune system is based in our gut as 25 to maybe 75% of our, our immune system is based in our gut. And um, I think it would come as no surprise that part of the reason our gut biome is so messed up is because we get antibiotics too frequently. Patients and doctors are both guilty of this. And we eat animals that have been fed antibiotics. And we don't eat so great. So that's all contributing to this. One of the things, too, from my specialty, we've known for many, many years that babies that are born by C-section just seem to have more trouble with food allergies and asthma. And, that doesn't make any sense. It used to be like, well, they don't get that fluid squeezed out of them. Maybe that's why I have asthma, which makes no sense because that goes away very quickly. And now what's, what's coming out to be clearer is that when babies are born by C-section, what they find is instead of the bacteria that you're supposed to have in their gut, they have bacteria that more mimics what's on the skin, which is not supposed to be in your intestines, as opposed to the flora or the good bacteria that they would have gone, gotten going through the birth canal 
which is what babies are supposed to do. So this nutritional conference I went most recently to, this one guy who's a very strong proponent of probiotics, and if you have kids or grandkids, or are gonna have kids or grandkids, if they have to have their babies born by C-section, what they do is they start giving them a probiotics right from the get-go, the newborns. And if they're born that way, they seem to be a little bit behind the eight ball, and this is maybe a way to help that from happening. When they looked at probiotics in mice, um, they did show improvement or prevention of, and these are mice that are sometimes genetically profiled to have some of these diseases, which is why they can study them for certain conditions. So prevent or improve rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and type 1 diabetes. Again, I bolted periodontitis for reasons I explained before. It does seem certain strains may help with, with gum disease. I think most of us are familiar where you get probiotics, particularly things like yogurt, as long as it has live bacteria in it. Not all yogurt has bacteria in it. You have to look at the label. Kefir, which is just a liquid form of yogurt from the Eastern European area. Lassi is basically the same idea from the Indian part of the world. Um, aged cheeses, again, mostly those are the ones that are kind of funky smelling and they are expensive, kind of you have at those fancy parties. Uh, fermented foods, I think we're all familiar with sauerkraut, but it has to be, um, these are the ones that really don't have a lot of additives. They're just like homemade, made with just salt, kimchi, which is Korean cabbage, uh, miso, if you've ever been in a Japanese restaurant, you've all had miso soup, which is fermented soy. So these are good for you, except for the fact that some of them are high in sodium. So think about that too a little bit. If you're going to get a supplement, you want to make sure it has billions of cultures. That's pretty hard to find anything less than billions. It would be unlikely to see millions. They're just usually in billions. And you want to look for at least bifidobacterium and lactobacilli. That's pretty much going to be the case all the time. It's not really clear which strain of bacteria are good for which condition. They knew for some things like if you've had traveler's diarrhea or you have infantile diarrhea or you have diarrhea after antibiotic, which ones might work better, but they're not really sure. And they for sure don't know if you have dermatomyositis, which probiotic would be better for you. So basically just get a big variety and then you're probably good to go. Um, because these are live little critters, uh, keeping them in the refrigerator is going to prolong their efficacy. This is pretty rare, but, and the thing is, just about everybody in this room or knows somebody in this room who has, is on an immunosuppressant, or maybe has a port in, or has diabetes, <laughs> or is a little bit in the advanced age category, and they say to use caution in these people. It's pretty rare to have a problem. I'm on two... Uh, immunosuppressant drugs, and I've been doing probiotics for years, and nothing as bad happened to me. Uh, there are rare fungal infections that have been reported in those people that have taken Fluorostore. Some of you may have heard of Fluorostore. It's a, it's a therapeutic yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii, and this is one that I will give my patients in my practice if they're on an antibiotic to take it while they're on an antibiotic, because if you take a regular probiotic that has bacteria in it and you're on an antibiotic, it's just going to wipe them out with it, so you're kind of wasting it. So Fluorostore is a yeast. It's not affected by uh, antibiotics that are treating um, bacteria, so you can do them at the same time. Fluorostore you could buy at the drugstore. It's very easy to get. Whey. We've all heard of Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. Well, the two parts of milk are the curds, which is the casein portion, and then the whey is more the milky portion. So whey's been looked at, I think we've all heard about, you know, these new protein bars and weightlifters doing their whey protein. It has been looked at for, for health as a dietary source of cysteine, which is needed to make glutathione. And glutathione is a very important antioxidant. But as a neural supplement itself, glutathione is very poorly absorbed, kind of like back to the whole curcumin thing. So it might, and I underline may because I'm not, we're not sure, it may be helpful for autoimmune disease and myopathies, but the data is very limited and it's mostly presumed from some other kind of circuitous things that have happened. If you want to take whey, it's 20 to 30 grams a day, which seems kind of like a lot, but you know, it, it's doable. It's very, very safe. It's milk, basically, and it's had most of the lactose removed, so if you're lactose intolerant, it really shouldn't be a problem. If you're a vegan, then you're not going to want to do it because it is a cow's milk product. Um, but it's very safe. There have been some reports of intestinal discomfort and fatigue with very high doses. And there was one case of liver injury in a weightlifter who was also taking creatine. 
And as much as I think we'd all love to be weightlifters with the condition we have, I don't think any of us have to worry about that anytime soon. Other supplements, basically these are the ones that really aren't helpful, not to say you shouldn't have vitamin C or vitamin E. Remembering I did say vitamin E can be taken in too much of an amount. Uh, L-carnitine, some people have asked about that. There's just no good data about that. Glutamine, um, they looked at it because it helps people with myotonic muscular dystrophy. And we do have to help thank our MDA, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, for a lot of the research that's sort of scooted over our way. But unfortunately, this doesn't help us right now. And if you're on methotrexate, you want to be very careful with glutamine because it could actually raise your methotrexate level, which is probably not something your doctor would want to have happen without knowing about it. So these are three supplements you might not want to take, particularly if you have dermatomyositis or any other kind of autoimmune disease. Spirulina and blue-green algae, if you've ever seen those green drinks that they push a lot, like in the refrigerated section, a lot of them have spirulina in them, which might be great for some people, but I will never have it because I have dermatomyositis, and at least two people with DM have had a flare, um, or it started having DM after they took it. Again, it was only two people, but that's enough for me to stay away from it. I can eat other things. Echinacea, those pretty blue cornflowers that are finches like in the fall, which has been touted as maybe helping with colds and infections, maybe, maybe not. Um, that has produced flares of lupus. Again, some of us might have an overlap with lupus, including, including kidney problems. Alfalfa, similarly, has caused some lupus-like symptoms in both animals and humans, so you might just want to use a little caution with that. So this isn't all bad news, there is some hope. <laughs> So gluten sensitivity, I, I said earlier, maybe we should stay away from all wheat. So interestingly, I didn't know this until I started looking into this, there has been an association with myositis and gluten since 1976. Now, please be aware, this is not like thousands of people that have had this problem reported, but there have been reports of clinical improvement for people with all three of the conditions that we have in this room, IBM, DM, and PM, with being on a gluten-free diet. Now, the, the thing that people often confuse is just gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. Celiac disease is a serious autoimmune disease where you cannot have any gluten at all. I think we've all heard of it, at least if we don't know more about it. So what I'm, I'm not talking about those people who will have these anti-glutaminase, gliadin, endomyceal antibodies. That's not what I'm discussing. So these are people that might be sensitive to wheat or gluten, and it might aggravate their myositis. So the range of symptoms might be nothing, or it can include all these lovely things that some of us have experienced for other reasons, maybe. So substitutions, I think a lot of us are familiar with these as well, since there's gluten-free options everywhere now. And uh, one thing that people might not realize is that buckwheat does not have gluten in it, despite the name buckwheat. It is not gluten. So you can have that if you like it. And a lot of these things like sorghum and amaranth and tapioca are often put in these gluten-free flour mixes. So you might see them as components together. Any one by themselves are kind of weird tasting and they don't provide enough support for the uh, texture of the bread. So you can find cereals, pasta, breads, etc. So creatine, um, I want to talk about this a little bit because I mentioned the creatine a minute ago with the bodybuilder that had the problem with the whey. Um, so first I'm going to talk about creatinine, because some of these words get confusing. So creatinine, it has an extra IN in there. That's something we've all probably had measured, including people in here that don't have myositis. It's a metabolized end product of creatine, which we are going to talk about in a moment, and that's found in the blood, the muscle, and the urine. And we've all, if we've had our blood taken for just your regular blood work, they're going to check your renal function and they're going to say, oh, your BUN and your creatinine are fine, or they're not fine, or they're elevated. So BUN is blood urea nitrogen, and creatinine is the other component that they look at for your renal function. So that's just something you're going to hear about when you get your blood test. It has nothing to do with myositis. Creatine kinase, or creatine phosphokinase, otherwise known as CK or CPK, I'm sure we're all very familiar with that term, because that's the blood test that we've all had crazy sky high when our muscles are out of whack. So that's an enzyme that's involved in energy production, and that's what's being measured to assess how badly damaged or inflamed our muscles are. You can also measure it for the heart and the brain. So if someone comes into the ER and they think they might have a heart attack or a potential heart attack, they're going to also check their CPA, CPK, excuse me, and it can be differentiated into different types of, depending on what kind of muscle they're looking at. So now back to creatine. 
So creatine is considered a supplement, and a lot of the bodybuilders or weightlifters use this to increase muscle mass and strength. A Cochrane review in 2011 looked at this, and just to take a minute to explain what that is, a Cochrane review is, um, it's like a, a, sort of like an institution, I guess, you, if you will. It's usually done by a number of researchers who will take as many articles as they can find in the medical literature that were written in a reasonable fashion on a particular topic, whether it's a drug reaction or a drug effect or a disease in general, and they amass all these articles, make sure they were done properly, and then they try to group all that information together. Because as we know, sometimes in rare diseases or rare treatments, there just aren't that many people per study. So they try to group them all together and then just see which things really shake out in the wash and what, what works and what doesn't. So when they looked at this a few years ago, it did seem to be a worthwhile supplement with very few side effects. Again, sorry for IBM people, but it does seem to work for DM and PM. Now, for those of you that have been coming to these conferences for a few years, you might remember Dr. Ingrid Lundberg. She was the one that was instrumental. I see, I see some nodding heads. Um, she was on the medical advisory board, and a few years ago, she was not only on the board, but she gave some lectures, and she was the one that was responsible for this study as well as other studies that were really um, paramount in finally breaking through this barrier that muscle, excuse me, that exercise is bad for people with myositis. And she proved that not only is exercise not bad for people with myositis, it's actually very helpful and in, in, uh, increases oxygenation, it can change the way they fire, so we're not talking about that right now, but anyway, she is known to some of the people in this room and she did this work on creatine. So she's a big supporter of it um, and it does seem to work. If, what they did in that study is people had to take for about a week a, a bigger dose of 20 grams a day, and then afterwards, after you had the loading dose, you could just take three grams a day. Most people noticed improved performance. They were able to undertake more high-intensity exercise and stay longer with endurance. And this effect stayed the same for five months, meaning that it didn't get worse and worse and worse, is, even though they kept taking it, the, the effect was sustained. There really haven't been any side effects noted. And I remember years ago with my first rheumatologist, and I first heard about this, I said, what do you think of it? He goes, no, 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 it causes kidney problems. And um, it really doesn't, unless you have really bad kidney disease to start with, in which case you probably wouldn't want to do this. But it really is really quite safe. But again, sorry to say, it doesn't seem to work for IBM. I did try this for a short period of time, and the only reason I stopped is I got really lazy, because you're supposed to uh, do it about a half an hour before you exercise, and I just, I just, couldn't, I just couldn't do that. So, but it's a, it, if anybody's ever interested in trying it, it's a, it's a very fine white powder. It dissolves pretty much instantly in water. You can't see it, you can't taste it, it doesn't smell bad or anything. I, I just was lazy. But it does seem to work, and if um, you are interested in trying to increase your muscle mass and do some exercise with it, it's not just going to happen for no reason. You have to exercise with it. That was the bugaboo for me. <laughs> I don't mind exercising, I just couldn't time it right. All right, so we're pretty much near the end here. So the summary, I think, again, pretty much hammered this home. Try to eat a variety of things. You want to avoid, avoid salt, the bad fats, too many processed or high glycemic foods. Try to eat the whole food instead of the supplement. Think about probiotics, maybe, especially if you've had antibiotics, which is pretty much everybody recently, seems like. Uh, maybe if you have an autoimmune problem, avoid those green things and echinacea. For everybody, you really, and even if you're the caregiver here, you might want to have your vitamin D level checked. For those of us that live in the north part of the country, I'm from Chicago, I mean, it was explained to me when the earth tilts away from the sun in the winter, the UVB rays, which are the ones that give us the way for our skin to make vitamin D, they can't even hit the, uh, they can't get through the atmosphere because the angle's so bad. Now, if you're lucky enough to live in Florida or some other hot, nice, sunny places, or you have you know, access to a, a sun lamp or something, good for you. But uh, most people in the northern climes are going to have a low vitamin D level unless you take it. So for everyone on that methotrexate, I think you should be on folic acid. Maybe your doctor would say otherwise, but that's pretty rare. For everybody, you could consider a gluten-free trial. I actually did it myself because I it took me a long time to figure this out. But I finally realized, you know, doctor, heal thyself. It took me forever to figure out that I couldn't eat bread anymore or gluten. Um, for things that don't really make sense to me, uh, it was an immediate improvement in my gastrointestinal tract, and that's been for the last five years I've been off of it, and then somehow in the last few months it seems like I can tolerate it again, so maybe I've healed something. But it made a huge difference for me. Didn't make my DM go away, but I, I felt better. 
Um, so again, for PM and DM, you might want to consider creatinine if you have good, um, if you have good uh, willpower about taking it before you exercise, which I did not. And there isn't a whole lot of data now, like I said, on coenzyme Q10 or whey or curcumin piperine, but it might be worth a try, and they're certainly fairly safe, again, unless you're on a blood thinner. I listed here, and you don't, please don't feel like you have to write these down. They will also be on the web. I just have a few extra slides here with some really good resources that help me put these talks together. And I just, I just think they're fun to troll around through sometimes just to see what new stuff is out there. And, and um, the one in the, let's see, uh, well, these are all good. They have also newsletters, which are kind of fun. They're really very inexpensive to subscribe to. Uh, the one on the top here about drug interactions, I would highly, highly recommend all of you to go on unless you're on nothing, which I don't think anybody here is in the case, including supplements and um, just all your medications. What I find, and I'm not a primary care doctor, but I see people who come in on 30, well, that's probably an exaggeration, 15 medications, 10 supplements, and everybody's got, you know, four different doctors. I mean, we all have multiple doctors because we have different problems. And everybody kind of puts their blinders on and prescribes this thing and this thing, and they don't necessarily look at the whole package. So I mentioned before, if you're on a PPI like Prevacid or Nexium, you might have a low vitamin B12. You might have a low magnesium. Um, if you're on some other drugs, they might be interacting and you might not be absorbing them well. And we all pay really good money for some of these drugs, and you want to make sure you're getting what you need. So just something to, to think about, um, not to get you know, mad at your doctor. And clearly, if the pharmacists were, were plugging all these things in, they certainly have the means to figure this out, too. So if you don't want to do this, maybe go to your friendly pharmacist and say, hey, I'm not sure if you have all these in this pharmacy, but I want to make sure that I'm not doing something wrong by combining these things together. And as you know, sometimes you just have to separate whether it's the drugs from each other or the drugs from food or vi certain vitamins can't be taken together. So something to think about. Um, and there's a wonderful woman here whose name is Phyllis. She's, I think, in another talk. I met her at this conference about two or three years ago, and she was the one that told me about that top thing called Consumer Labs, and it's fabulous. It's very inexpensive to join it. Um, it's like the consumer reports for supplements and nutri nutrients and vitamins, and it's really user-friendly. They basically will take not every brand out there, but they'll take really common brands and see if their content is what they say they are, if the percentage of the curcumin is what it says it is, is the, is the fish oil filtered, is it cheap, what's the cheapest per capsule, which is vegan, which, so it's really, really great. Um, the other ones too, the Lion Pauling Institute, they've got a great website with all sorts of interesting databases on there. Um, and then the NIH one at the bottom is, it's very user friendly, it's not always as complete as I would like it, but it's also a fun one to look at. And then these are just some books I put up. Um, I don't expect anybody to, to read all these. If you're looking for just good general health information, the first two books, the first one I've recommended for many years, some of you have seen him on like PBS. He does those things all the time, you know, raise money. Um, I just think his stuff makes sense. It's not a weird diet. It's kind of what I just told you guys. The second book I just fell upon last year, and that's where I got the business about the uh, omega-7s and the happy cows and happy happy sheep and kangaroos. Um, Tyler Graham is a dietitian slash chef, I think, and Drew Ramsey is a psychiatrist. And um, I think we could all be a little happier. But anyway, it's, it's a very well-written book. It talks about um, things you shouldn't, shouldn't eat. I will warn you, though, if you read this book, I think on every page or so, there's a little like circle. And throughout the book is peppered 100 reasons to not eat processed food. And some of the things in there are pretty awful and disgusting. So you might just want to be warned before you read this that you are going to be icked out by reading some of these things about what we've been eating. Um, and I believe that's the last slide. So thank you for your attention. Um, I think we have some time. For some reason, they allowed us two hours, which I think is crazy. But I'd be happy to stick around as long as you. Uh, I don't know whose arm went out first. but. Um, Smart balance or margarine or what's butter. the bet or butter? butter. Okay. Yeah. Well, I like butter. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, they're all fats. Um, the thing with saturated fat, I think it was at Time or something magazine recently had that whole bugaboo about now. They're, now we're all confused about butter again. Um, 
saturated fats are not great for us. Now, if they're from grass-fed cow butter and you're not eating like a pound of butter every day, I mean, I think a little butter's fine. Um, the problem with margarine is a lot of those are partially hydrogenated fats. Now, the Smart Balance or Earth Balance, or something, I think I have that one too. Um, I mean, the nice thing about those is they spread a lot faster than butter. You gotta wait for it to, yeah, I know, I, I do the same thing. Yeah, well, generally speaking, and I think all of us know this, that if it stays solid at room temperature for a while, it's more saturated. And that might not necessarily be a bad thing. You just don't want to have an overbalance of saturated and no unsaturated. And polyunsaturated might be better maybe than mono, but that's not really clear either. If you have, again, balance is, you know, kind of the name of the game. But, I mean, I enjoy butter once in a while, too. Sometimes you just have to, you know. Are all of your presentations, your slides, going to be on the TMA? They should. In fact, um, the same present I did the pre same presentation the last two years. The only thing is I added the way the salt, and what was the other thing I did? I forgot now. Did did, make it yeah, no, that was on last year, too. Anyway, it's already on there from last year, but the one I just showed you, if it's not on now, it should be by the end of the conference. But it will be there. The, all the resources are already there from last year. I didn't change any of the resources. And can you explain why potatoes aren't good, white potatoes aren't good, and sweet potatoes are? Aren't they both in the ground? Yeah. Considered night, I think they call them what, nightshade vegetables? Well, yeah. Um, so, well, there are yams and sweet potatoes, and technically they're a little bit different. But white potatoes have a much higher glycemic index. Now, that's not to say potatoes are horrible. Potatoes have vitamin A, they have vitamin C, they have fiber, they have potassium. They're, they're not bad for you, but if, um, like I, I usually have, I buy organic potatoes. I just, again, I, I don't know if any of you guys know um, Michael Pollan. Anybody know who Michael Pollan is? He wrote um, The Animal D Dilemma, and he just wrote this book called Cooked. Okay. He, um, the Omnivore's Dilemma, and, um, oh, help me out, somebody. Um, I can't think of the other book. He just wrote Cooked. Um, anyway, he's been a food writer for many, many years, and he did this really interesting book uh, that I was just mentioning, and he went to some potato farmers, and they were, he was just talking about the fungicides that they put on these things are so strong that they can't like come into the building for a couple days. Anyway, but they have a high glycemic index. I mean, I eat French fries, and when I go to the restaurant, I don't say, you know, are these organic potatoes? I'm not gonna eat them. I mean, I just eat them. I just don't eat them every day, and that's not all I eat. So it's again a matter of balance, and um, you know it. But they're also usually French fries, for example, are usually fried, and so you're getting that extra oil that's really not very helpful. Did you have a question? Yeah. What you mentioned vitamin D. Well, what about d d uh, vitamin D3, which is used in conjunction with calcium? Although you mm -hmm. mentioned calcium. Mm -hmm. Well, what? It, how is that different then from plain old vitamin D, which you were? Uh, discussed in your presentation. Well, if you look for vitamin D supplements, it usually says vitamin D2 or vitamin D3. And it's just a matter of like which um, metabolite it is. So they're both vitamin D. Um, for whatever reason, like the prescription version, the 50,000 units that I took, mm -hmm. it's only available as vitamin D2. I think one's more, um, I should remember this, I think one's more plant-based. Um, anyway, they're, they're both going to work. Oh, okay. uh, usually the supplements you get off the shelf are going to be vitamin D3. When I'm, I'm inter they're interchangeable, really. It's the same thing. But yes, vitamin D is very important for calcium absorption. Yeah. The reason I didn't bring up calcium is that most people get enough calcium, and now they're thinking another thing we've all been hearing too a little bit is that too much calcium is also not good for us either, um, for the heart. Exactly. We don't want calcifications in our heart. And so the problem with calcium is that people are told, well, you need 15 mil 1,500 milligrams or 1,200 milligrams a day. But if you eat dairy products, if you eat broccoli, if you eat a lot of sesame seeds, if you have sardines, you're getting calcium. And then if you don't look at what that is, and then you supplement that with 1,500 milligrams of calcium, you're getting too much. So um, I don't worry about the calcium as much. I think we probably get enough. But yeah, you certainly need calcium too, especially for bones and people on prednisone. And did, did, oh, go ahead. I'm just wondering why creatine doesn't work for IBM patients. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm not an expert on this at all. I just looked at the literature and that's what it said. Now, that being said, um, you know, years, or not that long ago, they said, well, IVIG doesn't work for IBM either. And then some people have had a response to it. So it's safe. You know, as long as you don't have kidney disease and if you have some discipline, <laughs> like I said. The only, the only problem is, like I wanted to make clear, and I, I realized it's not on the slide, so I'll have to improve that for next year. 
is um, it doesn't work just by taking it. You have to exercise to get the benefit. So if you're just planning to down it three times a day or the three grams a day and expect your muscles to bulge out, that's not going to happen. It's, um, and I remember years ago before I knew more about it, the thinking behind it was, well, it just plumps up your muscles. It just like hydrates them. So it's like artificial. So if you stop it, it's just going to shrink right back down again. I don't know if that's really the case, but you can't just take creatine and expect to get muscle mass. You have to, it just might advance it faster. I don't know why it doesn't, well, why, why do we not know anything about why it doesn't work for IBM? So it's frustrating. Sorry? Exactly, unless you have bad kidney disease, and that's really the only reason you shouldn't use it. And it's not expensive either. Oh. When I visited uh, Dr. Moore, Dr. Tom Moore at Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. who I think uh, is probably one of the top urologists in the field of um, IBM. He Did you say neuro? You said neurologist? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He had recommended creatine. He didn't, he didn't swear by it, but what he said was, uh, I would recommend you try it. Did he, and again, just based on what I just said, did he say just take it or did he say take it and try to exercise after you? Okay, all right, I want to make sure that he's. That's understood with creatine, you can have to take it and you know, sit around being a circuit I've been reading some interesting studies, I don't have the study with me in the next brain, but regarding the use of olive oil with MS. And what they have found in MS is, in, in the fiber, some of the same thing they find in IBM patients. And I'm sorry, they find what the same as IBM? The, I'm sorry. You said I, the fiber? Yeah, in the muscle. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't yeah. hear what you said. Okay. That, you know, some of the same properties uh, was found in IBM patients. And the study was relating to the use of all I'm wondering if you know anything about olive oil at all and the efficacy of that. Well, not specifically to to myositis necessarily, but one of the things I, I've been reading a little bit more recently about is, um, you know, a lot of countries, especially Italians, take a lot of pride in their olive oil. And then everybody seems to be making olive oil nowadays. And there's, you know, everybody's got their own version of olive oil. Well. I think the reason that they take a lot of pride in their olive oil is because it's, it's almost like a fine wine. It has a lot to do with the terroir, if you were, will, you know, where it's grown, and it's also the freshness of the grapes. So I think a lot of us know like extra virgin is like at the first press, and it hasn't been messed with, basically. But what I didn't really realize, I mean, it kind of makes sense. It's a fruit oil. It's, a, it's based from a tree. It's not something that's chemically made. So it's not going to last forever. And we all know that oils can go rancid. Now, um, some people keep their oils in the fridge. I don't because I use, I use them pretty frequently on the stove, and it would just be too much back and forth. But um, the fresher it is, the better. And the thing I was just reading was that after it's been pressed, meaning you know the olive's been pressed and you've got this fresh oil, the antioxidants, the flavonoids, these, these good chemicals are only going to really be around for about four months. Now, I know my bottle of olive oil lasts way longer than four months because I'm not like glugging it down like a drink. So, um, so one might say, well, maybe we should be doing that. Maybe we should have a little shot of olive oil every day, you know, just the, the real fresh stuff, you know, like these guys at the farmer's markets that pressed it in their backyard and now they've got it, you know, it tastes, it tastes very different when it's fresh. I mean, if it's old olive oil, it's just going to taste like grease. It's not going to really have a flavor. So I don't know anything specifically about your question, but... Um, this whole Mediterranean diet thing, a lot of it is based on the fact, because they have a lot of fish, they have a lot of olive oil and fresh fruits and vegetables. So, and that's been very, very much shown to be good for heart health. But then I think. Well, if you'd like to uh, provide me with your contact information, I'll send you a study. Okay. But there's two studies. Okay. Well, my email is in the brochure, because okay. I'm on the board, so all of our emails are there. <laughs> I'm an IBM person, mm -hmm. and I'm dealing with physicians who've never dealt with this disease or have much experience with myositis. 
And the first neurologist I saw said, be sure you're getting enough protein. So we talk a lot about sodium and fat and um, what we need to get on a daily basis. But I've been trying to understand this whole protein equation. I have chosen not to eat um, birds or animals for about 30 years. So I tend to get um, protein from non-animal sources. So are you a vegan? Not a vegan. I'm a quasi-vegetarian. I'd say I do eat eggs. OK, so, but no dairy? Fish. No, no, I'm dairy. So you're, well. sorry, you're a pescatarian. Okay. okay. Pescatarian. Thank you. I just don't eat animals or birds. That's the Okay, the got it. So, <laughs> can you talk to us a little bit though about the importance of protein and how much we should be getting either with IBM or myositis? I'm hearing I should be taking, I should be having 80 grams a day. I am a heavy person, but that's why I, I went through the screening from the Novartis BYM trial and got rejected, um, and they said I was eating about 70 grams of protein a day, really working hard on focusing on that, and apparently that's not enough. So, do you have any insight on protein? Wait, they they dis disallowed they, you from the study because you weren't eating well, enough protein, it wasn't or just that reason? I'm a strong walker too, and um, I'm not the profile they were looking for. Right. But that was one of the things that came up. They were saying that you need eight grams of protein for every. Well, and and as I try to make the disclaimer at the beginning, I'm not a dietitian, so a lot of this stuff is self knowledge, and so I don't I don't counsel people on like how much protein they should have. And the controversy I think here for all of us with myositis is sort of like the creatine creatine thing is is eating more protein good and give us more muscle mass? And I, I mean I don't think that's the case. As far as how much you should have, um, that formula sounds about right to me, but. Um, I, I, it's funny, I didn't come across anything about that when I was doing my research to do these talks. So I'll add that to the list. But um, I mean, it, it would seem just to make common sense to all of us that if we're losing muscle, which is mostly made of protein, we should have more protein to get the muscle back again. And I think if nothing else, that's where the creatine kind of comes into play and the whey. I mean, that's why the bodybuilders use it, because it is a, a very refined form of protein. So. Um, but specifically to your question, I can't say, oh, well, people with myositis need this many grams a day of protein. I, 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 don't, I don't have any information for you about that, but I, I can look into it. So thank you for the question, because I, I don't know the answer. Okay. Yes? And I was wondering about juicing. So say you're juicing, and you're saying don't have too much spinach all at the same time because of the oxalates or whatever. Mm -hmm. So how long could you say you would have spinach in your, in your juicing thing for two weeks? And then stop for two weeks, or? Are you just having, like, just spinach juice by itself? Well, not just by itself. Say you're adding three or four vegetables or two fruits at a time. Oh, that's fine. I, if you keep doing that for month after month, would that cause a problem? I mean, you need, you need to change out your vegetables and fruits. Because, I mean, I don't change them out a lot, but I do change them. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think it's just common sense. Like, if, if all you ate all day long right. was juiced spinach, yeah. Right. I mean, I feel well, sorry yeah, for you for one thing, but yeah. yeah, but you're, you know, you're probably, <laughs> yeah, but you're putting like a banana in there or some, yeah. I mean, are I, you, no, no, I put different vegetables. Just vegetables. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. I use, if I use fruits and vegetables yeah. at the same time. Yeah. It sounds like you're getting a good balance. Plus that's not all you're eating all day, no, right? It's not. Okay. No. No. Yeah. Right. I mean, the example I was giving, like with the chocolate milk, it just said they're being taken together. So the oxalate and the chocolate is kind of like canceling each other out. So that was a minor example, but yeah, it, it was just a reminder that we should vary our diet, that you okay. shouldn't just eat, you know, spinach all day long. Yeah, and one more thing is, is you know they have the spray at the grocery store that supposedly gets sprayed with the pesticides on your vegetables, is, does that really work or not? You know, I, I used to buy that years ago, and I think you can also do the same thing with just vinegar and water. Um, the problem is, and, and I please, if there's someone here that knows more about orchard stuff than I do, my my con my concern about pesticides. Um, and again, I don't only eat organic stuff, but um, if it were if it were that simple, then they wouldn't have to worry about the rain, you know, because the rain would just wash it off. I get worried about it. The rain. Okay, there's there are pesticides on the trees. The rain comes. Now the pesticides are in the ground. Where does that go? It goes in the roots of the tree, and then it goes out through the fruit. So to me, the pesticides are probably inside the fruit or the vegetable, not just something you can wash off, which is why sometimes I don't even bother washing the fruit because I don't think it's going to matter. 
You know, like I'll just, I'll get a, you know, I'll confess, I'll get cherries from Michigan because they're fantastic. And before I get home, they're not washed, they're, they're probably full of pesticides, I throw them in my mouth and spit the seeds out, obviously. But it, I think sometimes, I remember talking to a grocer who was like a, um, he started this kind of fancy grocery store near us, and they were from California, and not offending anybody from California, but he's a big produce guy, they're from California. And so I asked him about that, because they don't have a lot of organic fruits there, and I said, well, you know, what do you think of it? He goes, oh, well, you know, we feel that the, the antioxidants and all these other things outweigh the problems with the pesticides. And that may very well be true, but I just don't think we know. Now, I'm past my childbearing years, so I'm not really worried about, you know, having a weird pregnancy or something if I eat um, pesticided foods. I don't think it's going to make my dermatomyositis worse if I eat pesticided foods. I just, if I can, I try not to. That's all. I mean, we don't we don't want to get crazy about this, but you just you know making some common sense things. Yes, sir. I wanted to talk about uh, the EPA. Is it really big? Anything? You're talking about the Environmental Protection Agency, not Eco. I, I, I can't say it. Icona Penta. Yeah. Anytime a pesticide has a high residual rate where it sticks around for a long time, over the last 20 years they keep on changing what's allowed, what's allowed, what's allowed. Yeah. So first you got the federal guideline, then each state can do what they want. And then the state, and I'm from New York, so on Long Island, they have, there's two counties on Long Island that, here's the, here's the EPA, the federal regulation, here's the state, and then the county on Long Island has, a, it's, it's like crazy. So what I want to say is that the more dangerous a pesticide is, they just keep on limiting. It has a longer residual effect, like you said, it goes off the trees into the aquifer and back up around. Mm -hmm. Anything that's going to last a long period of time, they, have, they, they keep restricting it so you can't use it anymore. Now, I don't see the lady in here that I had lunch with today. I don't think she's in here. She um, has a caregiver from Cambodia. So we had a lovely discussion about Cambodia. And one of the things she said is that she's never seen the degree of illness before in her life till she moved to this country, because they just don't see this kind of stuff where she's from, because they don't have pretty much any of the things we were talking about. They don't have GMO foods, they don't have processed foods, they don't have pesticides, they, they eat this, they, they pick it and eat it that day. So I think we have a lot to learn from our, you know, less civilized societies where they're doing so much better than we are. So it's, a, it's kind of an eye opener. There were some more questions, I think, right? Yes? About juicing, I have a friend who replaced food with juice and he juices organic vegetables. oranges and lime juice, but eat as much fruit and vegetables as you want. So uh, my question is, um, is it a good discipline to shoot for to do daily juicing of organic vegetables for your skin? Inflamed skin. Oh, well, I don't see why it would hurt. I mean, the other thing, the, besides the nutrients the vegetables have, you know, the minerals and vitamins um, and water, because I think a nice thing about juicing is that people sometimes don't realize how much, how important it is to hydrate. And so for, if you're talking about skin in general, hydrating your skin is just good and hydrating from the inside is better than slapping water on your face. Um, uh, I don't see why it wouldn't help you. I guess it just depends on which vegetables you're putting in there. The thing about the fruits, and obviously fruits have a lot of benefits to them, it's just the sugar is the problem. So I mean, anybody that's ever dealt with diabetes or knows somebody with diabetes, they have to be limited. I was supposedly a gestational diabetic, and with my first daughter, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna, you know, she's gonna come out terrible if I have like a half a glass of orange juice. So I was like terrified of sugar. Um, so we know that there are things you can't have if, if you're worried about your sugar, but um, I, I don't see why you, if you were just asking if the vegetables are gonna help your skin, I, I don't see why not. The one, the only downside to the juicing that I see is that when they've looked at prebiotics, some of you may have heard that term, basically these are the foods that the probiotics need because they need to eat too. So prebiotics are um, things like chicory and inulin. Sometimes you see them in like those protein bars. But a lot of times just the roughage from the fruits and vegetables that we eat are good for the probiotics. And plus we all know about that for colon health and we need fiber, blah, blah, blah. So if you're just juicing and you're not eating any of the fiber and the roughage, um, that might maybe be one detriment of juicing, but I know everyone thinks it's like the best thing since sliced bread to do juicing. 
Again, I'm just too lazy. I would just eat the apple. I mean, it's just faster that way. I have a juicer and I never use it. Yes, I did a little research that it's actually good for you to chew, and chewing is good for your brain. I don't know if anyone's seen any research on that. But it's not good to just have a liquid diet. Well, I think it's imp it's also, you know, just getting back to enjoying your food. I mean, we should enjoy what we're putting in our mouths. I mean, it shouldn't just be like a process just to keep our, our bodies going. But, I mean, I like to eat, which is why I have to exercise because, you know, calories in, calories out, right? <laughs> yeah. I was interested in the uh, connection between DM and periodontal disease mm -hmm. that you brought up. I've never heard that before. And a lot of them haven't, including well, my dentist. <laughs> Dysplasia in the mouth? Is there, I mean, is it just periodontal disease? You mean like lichen planus or something? Or, uh, or abnormal cell tissues on the tongue, in the mouth? I just wonder I, I have no idea. Maybe would go a little further. I mean, anything inflammatory in the body, I think we can all chalk up to something that's not right that we're doing or having or genetically. So, um, yeah, the, periodonti the periodontitis was something that. Um, I mean, again, I found out about it. It was, it was kind of frustrating, especially because my dentist is married to a rheumatologist, and he kept hammering me for years. You know, your plaque is terrible. Your, gin, your gingivitis is terrible. And literally, after like my third month, it was the first dental appointment I had after my third month or fourth month of IVIG. I don't remember. It's like, man, what, your gums look fantastic, which is quite the compliment to get from your dentist because he's a man of few words. And he said, what have you done? You're, I'm like, well... I'm finally getting my disease treated, I've been, and I brought him that article. He's like, "Oh, that's kind of interesting," but he kept hammering me about flossing, and so, and he could tell. And when I was just here to see him, goes, "I bet you're feeling pretty good, aren't you?" I said, "Why do my gums look good?" He said, "Yep." So, so your rheumatologist may not know about it. Your dentist probably doesn't know about it. So, if anybody's getting, you know, annoyed by their dentist that you're not flossing enough, just say, "Well, here, this is why." If you have dermatomyositis, at least. Was there another hand that went up somewhere? Yes, Mary Ann. You and I had this discussion. You know, when you go into a restaurant and they say, what would you like to drink? There's always the challenge of, gee, do I get a Coke or a Diet Coke? Oops, I shouldn't. Neither. What I just saw there. Um, Water. Well, should, should I get iced tea? Well, oh, there's a lot of caffeine there. Um, well, there's water. Well, there are those of us who hate water. <laughs> so, you know, then there's vitamin water and there's flavored water. And, you know, every time I go into a massage, I take my bottle of water with me because I know I should have water after my massage. But I usually am carrying a bottle of Propel. And she wants to take it away from me and hit me over the head with it because she says the chemicals in the Propel are worse than me drinking, you know, <laughs> something awful. It's really difficult figuring out what to drink other than water, and then even then, the bottled waters, the special mineral waters. Okay, well, first of all. Wine, okay, sorry. <laughs> there you go, a little wine every day, great antioxidants. Um, well, water is great. Water can be boring. I love water, so it doesn't bother me. So if you can't get away with like, you know, asking for that lemon squeeze or the lime squeeze, or maybe they'll dunk a little maraschino cherry in there for you. I don't know. Um, tea is not bad. I mean, if you have dark, you know, hot or black tea, like they serve iced tea at lunch, and I only drink a little bit of it because that'll keep me up tonight. Um, but you know, green tea, white tea. They have flavored teas, and they can be iced. You know, um, of course, you have to go to the right restaurant where they're going to serve that stuff. Um, if you like coffee, coffee's actually a, it's got high antioxidants in it, and the the downside of coffee is usually because people load it with sugar and milk, um, or they have these you know ridiculous ones from Starbucks with caramel and all sorts of nasty stuff in there. But if you just have black coffee, it's actually quite good for you. And there have been. You've probably seen little things like the more coffee you drink, the better your brain function is or something. Obviously, you have too much of it. You're going to get jittery and stay up all night. But if you can get um, decaf coffee, I mean, do you like coffee, Marianne? Okay. Well, and the other thing about decaf, <laughs> more bad news. Yeah, they're, they're decaffeinated usually with benzene, which is not good. So if you're going to get decaf coffee, make sure it's water filtered. But like today, I had decaf at the lunch, and I didn't ask them if it was water filtered. I just said, can I please have some decaf? So once in a while, it's okay. But um, Green Mountain, for example, if you guys use any of those K-Cups or whatever, 
their water filter decaffeinated coffee, but a lot of the decafs are benzene treated. But coffee is safe, you know, um, tea's great. You can have flavored teas. Hibiscus tea, if you've never had hibiscus tea, um, it's herbal, I mean, it's a flower. You've all probably seen hibiscus flowers. Um, it's got kind of a nice flavor and it's not, it's not sweet, but it's not plain either. So Marianne, that might be, you're in Florida, they have probably hibiscus everywhere. You could probably just pull it off a tree and stick it in your water. Yes. I usually am not crazy about water sometimes. So at a restaurant, I ask for some lemon on the side, but it's very hard to get them to put them on the side. They land up putting them in the water. And what I recently heard was because of people touching the lemons and you don't know if they're washed or anything like that, they don't use gloves when they put them in, cut them and put them in your water, that it's only best to squeeze them in and don't put the lemon in yourself, you know, in the glass of water. But it's, even though you say, for me, some of my experiences, if you say on the side, they still don't get the message, meaning like on a plate or something right. like that. Well, I, I remember hearing that same thing about the cut lemons and the, you know, we're all going to die from germs from lemons. But, um, I mean, if you, hand or pa if you handle paper money, I don't know if you want to know about that, but I think some of you know where I'm going with that. If you handle paper money, you are getting way more germs than you would ever care to know about that are going to be more less of an issue than lemons. I mean, um, I know what you're talking about. If you're really that worried about it, just say, I would like a lemon. I would really appreciate it if I could have a fresh lemon that's washed. Of course, they might roll their eyes at you. Just say, just say, you know what? Make something up. Say, I'm on chemotherapy. I have to be very careful about germs. I mean, they won't know, you know. Or just say that. Just say, yeah, I mean, I'll think, I really don't think you have to worry about germs. We, get, we, we are so inundated by germs all the time. Um, and our bodies usually have a decent way of taking care of it. But if just say, I, I really don't want it in my glass. Could you please put it on a plate or on a saucer or something? I do not want it in the water. Hi, I, I have IBM and um, I was told not to eat nightshade, anything from the nightshade family because that causes inflammation, is mm -hmm. that correct? Oh. If I eat a, a white potato or any kind of Eggplant potato, potato, potato yeah. a sweet potato, I can have. But any other kind, my stomach just blows up, really, and I don't feel comfortable. Well, I, that was another topic I meant to look into because it comes up once in a while. My father-in-law was terrified of nightshades. Um, and he read like every nutrition thing that ever came out and he took every vitamin known to man and it didn't help him in the end. But he was terrified of nightshades. And I never heard of that problem until he started making a big deal about it. And I think the word night, I, and let, maybe again, pipe up if someone knows this better. I think the nightshade comes from, as a lot of these weird terms come from, like, you know, the medieval times when it was some evil humors thing or whatever, and it just stuck. Um, tomatoes are very healthy. I mean, we know at least for men's health, for the lycopene, for prostate health, they're very, very healthy. They have a ton of vitamin C and vitamin A. Um, they're really good if you make them the right way. Um, potatoes, again, I already told you my problem with potatoes, and it's not that they're bad, it's just that they too much of a good thing is not good. Um, eggplant, I, I never thought eggplant had too much nutritional value, quite frankly, but I don't think they're evil. If you're having a lot of bloating or gas, which is what you implied, is that what you meant by uncomfortable after yeah, the food? Yeah, with, with white uh, russet potatoes. Yeah, I mean, that might just be, it doesn't agree with you, but... Potatoes, too. <laughs> well, but I don't think anyone's ever proven in, a, in like a scientific study, and again, I can add that to my research, that the, they actually cause, I know doctors say that, but I, I think they just pull that out of the air. Like, like as an allergist, what drives me insane, and I'm getting off topic here a little bit, but um, the people that come in here and say, well, they told me I can't have contrast dye because I'm allergic to shellfish. And that is like the oldest thing that they say out there, and it's completely not true. There's no relationship between dye and shellfish, ever. So for my patients that are allergic to shellfish, and the doctors, the radiologists keep perpetuating this, the, radi the cardiologists, 
I say, if they ask you if you're allergic to shellfish, just lie and say no, because it doesn't matter, and they won't give you the contracts. So things like this, the nightshade thing, I think somehow it's like they heard about it. It was like urban legend or that version of urban legend back in the day, and then it just perpetuated. I don't know. If, if they bother you, then don't eat them. But I, I don't think they're going to make your IBM worse. I, I just I can't believe that's true. I eat a lot of pistachios when I am sitting watching TV. Well, those are good. I mean, they're high in fat, so you just want to not over. I'm sorry, I cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh, that's the only thing that I can eat. Well, sweet potatoes are good. They're not nightshades, yeah. I don't think, or yams. Uh, yes. I just have a question. You know, when you're talking about the interactions of food, somebody told me a long time ago about um, coffee and calcium. That if I drink, you know, if I drink a cup of coffee and then I have a glass of milk, that I'm just I will not get any calcium out of that because the caffeine will negate it. And so I'm always a nervous wreck about I'm going to get my milk any time I've had caffeine or tea, tea or coffee. So does it really, really inhibit it that much? Well, the tea, like I said before, has those tannins in it, um, which is kind of why your tongue gets kind of dry with tea and, the, and tannins and wine and all that. So yeah. that, could, that can bind some things. Um, the coffee itself, it wouldn't be the caffeine that's doing it. It might be the fact that it's, you know, it comes from a plant and the cocoa has those... Um, the, uh, it can maybe bind some things too, but um, have you heard that? The not not specifically milk. coffee and milk uh, together, but um, I would hope that the little blob of milk you're putting in your coffee is not your only source of calcium anyway. No, I mean, but, you know, I want to take my my calcium pills in the morning, but I'm always afraid to take them oh, because the I'm supplement. afraid that I'm not going to be getting the benefit if I just had a cup of coffee. Uh, I can't really speak to that specifically. You've I never mean, heard that? not specifically, no. But it might be true. I just, okay. I just, I maybe I wouldn't take it and down three cups of coffee at the same time. It might limit the absorption. Okay. Yeah. Oh yes. Is that myth, urban the blood type diet. My husband read that book and was convinced. And um, I, I know what it is. And I think that if you read the book, it's very interesting. His, his. Uh, suppositions about things, and if, for those of you that don't know, it's a gentleman who uh, I think was carrying on the research of his father, if I'm not mistaken, and he believes that we all started out as type O when we were cavemen, and then as we left the cradle of civilization and went north and east and west, we went from being O to A, and then B, and then AB, because we mingled together, and then the O people, because all we had back then was saber-toothed tigers and wild boar to eat, that we may mainly eat meat, ate meat, and that's what O's are supposed to eat. Like beef heart is like the main thing they're supposed to eat. And like I told my husband, there's no way I'm gonna make you beef heart. And then as we got into the agrarian farmer thing, then they're supposed to be having you know, grains and then fruits and vegetables. And I don't think there's really a lot of scientific fact. I think what happens with that diet, because this is what my husband did, who's a physician and very smart and analytical, and I was a little surprised he fell for this, is that it's like a horoscope. And what he did is he read this. He goes, oh, yeah, those things, I don't, I don't really, they, they don't make me feel good when I eat them. And so then he said, he bought the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker, the whole book. And I read it and found a lot of holes in it in my, at, at the time, very limited understanding about these things. So, I mean, my, my view is if it's not a crazy diet and it makes you feel better, then great. I, I, I don't think there's a lot of scientific merit to that. And most, most people that are more knowledgeable than me would know that.